Okay, our our next speaker is uh, Dennis Toddy with the Midwest Climate Hub, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the North Central Climate Collaborative actually spans three climate hubs. So I did pull over Danell Peck with the um, Northern Plains Climate Hub. And um, if anyone with the Southern Plains Hub is, is on here, let me know and I'll pull you over. But uh, Dennis was our, our prepared speaker for today. And uh, he is sharing his screen now. And I'll go ahead and let him take it away. <laughs> I'm there we go. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. All right, last piece. Okay, are you seeing the full screen now? Looks good. Okay. I have to emphasize that Han said prepared. That has never, ever been used for Dennis Toddy in description. So thank you, Hans, for saying that once in my lifetime. I appreciate that. Okay. Now for something completely different. Um, actually, no. Uh, it, it, it is, we're taking a little different path here, a little, a little different thought on some things. Um, but it's not completely different because we're going to talk about a document that was released uh, about a year ago um, that Linda Procopy was a co-author on. Uh, this was a, a document of a bunch of a few USDA connected people and some university people talking about climate change pieces in agriculture. Uh, you've heard a lot about climate change in agriculture the last couple of days, but now we're going to talk about some pieces of how we connect this to agriculture. Um, so we'll, we'll dive into this here. Uh, this was done by a set of really smart authors and me. They allowed me to be part of it. Thank you for doing that. It was, it was a lot of fun doing it together. I should also go back and, and quickly introduce myself. I am the director of the, of the USDA Midwest Climate Hub. Hans is correct. NC3 covers, uh, most of NC3 is in the Midwest Climate Hub. We do grab part of the Northern Plains Climate Hub. And then Kansas is that, Linda talked about boundary organizations. Kansas is one of those boundary organizations or boundary states that depends on how you, you dice things up there in the Southern Plains Climate Hub. Um, so we, we, we all share some of the connections with this. Um, we enjoy working with this group uh, and we enjoy working with a lot of folks in the Midwest because of the climate change agriculture connection that is very strong in this area. So um, briefly about me, I'm originally an Iowan, so I'm happy to be back in Iowa, ag meteorologist, uh, used to be Laura Edwards in South Dakota, which is brings up a whole set of other issues we won't talk about right now. Used to be the state climatologist there. Laura has capably taken over after I left. Okay, I'm going to give you the opportunity now to to follow along if you want to. Uh, what what we're going to talk about are these indicators. A little bit about the background and and, and touch on some of the indicators here. You can go grab them if you want to. Uh, and and look at them. I, I, I give you permission right now to go ahead and look at them if you want to, because it's really a cool document. It, it is talking about the indicators, but each of the indicators is, the, 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 the structure of the document is set up so that each of the indicators is talked about individually and can be used by extension, outreach, just to give you a snippet of understanding about that indicator and how agriculture is dealing with it. Um, this is, I said that just uh, released about a year ago. This was about a, well, it's about three years ago we started this whole process trying to put it together. And we'll talk about that as we go along here. All right, let's, okay, just a quick background. Uh, part, and I, I should also recognize Meg Walsh from the USD office, the chief economist who uh, helped lead this group of people. I will, I will say lead, maybe cajole, pull, try to get things along. Uh, and she put these slides together. So we were part of that, but uh, these are largely her work. So ag is a huge part of the US economy, especially in the Midwest. Um, obviously we've talked about ag has a high level of risk exposure to climate and weather. Uh, day-to-day -day activities, drought going on in the Northern Plains right now, 
uh, you know, some wetness in the Southern Plains, freeze issues we've had in the spring, uh, and then background changing conditions are all part of this. Uh, so agriculture is having to adapt to it. And we've got to look at these longer term conditions. But we're trying what we're the, the goal of this is to try to document the changes and indicate what the what 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 changes we can follow as part of that. We'll talk about that as we go along. The, the document on the right, not the document, the figure on the right kind of lays out of, uh, you know, kind of this process we think about here how climate change is changing what's going on in weather and climate. And that's the physical indicators that you see in the middle of that. And then kind of how those physical indicators are changing other things in regard to agriculture. There's lots of different ways we can slice and dice and put this together, but it, it kind of gives you a scope of how things change. There are, you know, climate is changing in and of itself uh, in the way of changing some physical indicators, precipitation, heat waves, uh, that sort of thing. Those are in turn changing things like soil moisture, things with bi the biology, and then things that are downstream related to agriculture. Uh, so it's really interesting to start talking about these and start documenting, putting these together. So let's go ahead and keep rolling here. Okay, the background of this, the, the, the development was uh, as, as, many, as many issues you deal with, you get a bunch of people together to say, Here's the idea we came up with. Uh, Bill Hohenstein, who is the director of climate change within USDA, climate change office in USDA, I can't remember his exact title. He, he, he's kind of uh, above the hubs overall. Call, uh, task Meg with this and calling a group of people together. Uh, and, and then the, the, the goal of this was get these people together, talk about the overall scope, talk about what things are changing in agriculture, which ones we need to document, how we put the document together, and then kind of work on rolling it out. So we kind of did that process. Uh, then we had some stakeholders, some outside folks and said, we have these ideas. Can you give us some input on that? Some really good set of folks there. Drafted these, review, and then technical review, which getting through the USDA is, is, is uh, not, a, not a simple step. Let's put it that way. Now, I hate this when people do this, that, oh, just look at this overall, but that's what we are. The people on the left are the authors, uh, the author team. The people in the middle are the stakeholders. We said, here, give us some feedback on this. And then the people on the right-hand side are the reviewers. Uh, Laura Edwards, you'll see, was a reviewer here. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else I know of here who was who provided input. Um, but uh, on the left-hand side, uh, a few folks related to USDA, and then a number of university folks were involved with it, with a wide variety of backgrounds. Some climate folks, uh, some people with, uh, you know, so uh, Lou Ziska has a background in, in biology and climate, uh, and uh, then Linda Procopy, who has climate, but then this socioeconomic background, which also brings, as you heard before, this interesting background to the overall discussion. Okay, now let's take another step here. What's an indicator? Um, how, what, 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 what are we trying to figure out when we're talking about indicators here? Okay, it's something we can measure, calculate, or a statistic. Uh, trying to understand some, some, some trend or condition. Uh, we're connecting community needs to, to data and information. You know, something happening in agriculture is reliable and robust. Can we measure it again? Just because you can measure it one time, can you continue to measure it? Uh, relates to some underlying issues uh, framework, uh, can be used in decision making and can be directly observed or calculated. So, you know, there are things that we know are impacting agriculture, but sometimes we can't put them into an indicator. We can't put those pieces together related to that. Um, and I should also add as a side thing, I, I don't know if this is actually the case. My personal view is this should not be a standalone first shot. Um, as I've thought about this in, this indicator document more, I, I think that we need to um, do uh, some more of this, do some more thinking about how we refine this, how we add some more indicators in, in this overall aspect. Okay, some other uh, definitions about the criteria for this report. Clear relationship to climate. Uh, you know, got to be able to, to directly relate this to climate. I'm a climatologist. I can relate anything to climate, but that's not always the case. So uh, clear relationship to climate, relevant to agriculture, food systems, food security, 
um, some historical context. Uh, this was, was kind of a problem in some of the cases because as we've advanced in our monitoring systems, there are certain things that we've been able to observe for a shorter period of time, but we don't have a long period of time for that. We tried to use 30 years as, as, as our period to, to deal with. We fudged that in some cases because the things were so important that we're talking about. Um, available, well-documented, can we tie it back to research literature, published USDA reports, anything like that? Um, we, it, because you know this is climate and, and it, it can be controversial, uh, we wanted to make sure it was clearly documented and be able to, to, to deal with that. And then multiple production types and aspects. Um, Certain things are impacted in one place, other things are impacted in, in other places. Uh, you know, changes in humidity are impacting a lot of different places. Um, but, you know, certain changes aren't impacting other places. So we tried to be able to, to, to connect that. And as you also go through, and if you look at the document, uh, you might say, well, this issue is an impact in our area. Yes, it is, but we wanted to try to move the examples we used around for the different indicators throughout the country so that some place didn't get left out. Uh, as we look through the author team, we still ended up being a bit Midwestern and a little bit East Coast specific, um, just the way it worked out. And, 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 and you know, it's unfortunate. So that's why I think we need to rethink uh, maybe another version after this. Okay. Here is the list of the indicators and, and the way we kind of broke them down. Again, the physical, ones related to crop and livestock, uh, biological, uh, phenological, and then the socioeconomic indicators. And, and I'll walk through them real briefly to give you a quick background on them. I, 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 you know, it's, I don't want to, uh, to, to do this ad nauseum or, or bore you too much. You're probably bored listening to me already, and I apologize for that. But uh, we want to introduce this, this document to you as much as we can. Okay, going to go walk through them uh, section by section. First one, physical indicators. These are things that are actually changing in regard to climate that are those, are, those primary kind of uh, pr changes that are leading to some of the, 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 the secondary ones. And these are ones we often talk about in relationship to climate already, but these we picked out some of the ones that are having specific impacts on agriculture. Extreme precipitation, changes soil moisture, uh, nighttime air temperatures, heat waves, and humidity. Okay, so kind of the physical indicators. Okay, extreme precipitation, pretty clear cut, clear, clear cut, uh, bigger rainfall events impacting a wide variety of production issues. Um, you know, in the upper Midwest, big changes related, you know, in early seasons, predict, precipitation particularly leading to soil and nutrient loss, some disease issues. We're going to talk more about that as we go along. Reduction in field work days, wet springs, so you're not able to get out there. Um, and, and then these have led to, you know, despite many in agriculture, you know, under, you know, disputing climate change issues, they're adapting to climate change already. You know, they're changing, they're, they're doing more tiling, they're doing drain, more drainage water management. Um, so extreme precipitation, bigger events. And, and, and in this case, even we're talking about events that are not so large, that have issues on, on soil and uh, and soil and nutrient loss in that springtime. Um, soil moisture is obviously a bigger one and one of the tougher ones. We agreed we we we, we this one we kind of fudged on because we don't have good long term soil moisture measurements. But soil moisture is really that really that integrator for all we talk about in the way of precipitation. In, in, uh, in agriculture, it's what's in the soil is the most important. So, you know, what is soil moisture? How is soil moisture changing along, um, you know, that, that relationship? So we've got an example here from USDA Scan Network. That's one of the longer term networks. And Hans, thank you for sharing that. You can go grab, go grab the document and pull along there, read along, read along at home, read along at home. Let's say it, let's say it that way. Um, you know, and then the issues of plant growth, again, uh, you know, uh, root development, any uh, soil nitrogen, any number of those things. But again, uh, we're, we're getting more about soil moisture measurement now in different forms. Still struggling with with the measurements and 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 details about it. 
nighttime air temperatures. Trent talked about the changes in nighttime air temperatures uh, and the changes in the 30 year normals and the impacts that has on uh, crops, you know, from a, from a pollination standpoint or viability of pollen. Uh, issues related to livestock, which we're going to talk about more as we go along here. So nighttime air temperatures being, you know, maybe a bigger change and a bigger impact uh, as we're looking at things. Heat waves. Um, heat waves are, are occurring more frequently. Uh, and, you know, in certain parts of the country and in certain, certain ways, particularly, uh, more in the southern U.S., southwestern U.S., we've got one going on the, right now that's going to be continuing into the next week or two here. Um, but changes in heat waves are it, leading to issues related uh, to crop production. And then the last of the physical indicators, humidity. Big changes in humidity over the last 50 years. Uh, the document on the right shows changes um, by a, a, a colleague of mine, Art Digatanu, who was also another, another ag climatologist involved in this, um, where we've seen significant, statistically significant changes in humidity over the last 50 years. When you increase humidity, that increases, uh, you know, the, the, the dew formation. We're going to talk about dew here in a little bit, um, but it also is related to Higher humidity keeps those overnight temperatures warmer. Higher humidity keeps your daytime temperatures from getting quite as high, but you don't cool down at night. So you're decreasing that, that daily temperature range that has been a bigger issue uh, uh, and, and you know, kind of the upper Midwest, maybe not as, as daytime high temperatures, but really high heat index episodes uh, that we're seeing as part of this. Okay, next one. Crop and livestock indicators. What's changing specifically related to, to crop and livestock? Uh, heat stress, growing region migration, and leaf wetness duration are the, are the three here. Uh, animal heat stress. Um, this, uh, the, the, the data here, again, we pulled, this is from the Plains area uh, and agricultural area in Colorado, uh, around Sterling, Colorado, where we're seeing increases in the, in, in the peak daytime heat stress. Uh, animal heat stress has a wide range of, of issues from reducing gain, reducing egg production, use, reducing dairy output to extremes of mortality. Uh, I did an interview yesterday on, on heat index, uh, heat impacts on, on livestock and found that there have been several events over the last 20 to 30 years where we've seen over 1,000 head losses in, in cattle in parts of Iowa and, and, and the Plains and under sometimes not severe conditions, but, but the mortality is the extreme end of it, but we've seen some big losses related to that. Um, indicators also related to this are, 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 are additional issues on heat stress are obviously temperature and humidity, but wind speed, sunlight uh, are bigger players in this because one of the ways you deal with livestock is by spraying water on them. But when you have higher humidity, and lower wind speeds, which was one of the cases we that, that there was a, one of the big losses, that doesn't work very well. And you actually can can worsen the situation because the wind is not going to move the 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 moisture away, and you end up uh, adding adding to the problem rather than fixing the problem. So, this is something where we can we can uh, track quite well over over time. Um, another one that we know exists, but it's good to call it out. Our crop growing region, where are we growing crops compared to where we used to? Um, that the corn and soybean growing area has shifted northward and northwestward over time, partially due to changes in genetics, but changes in climate. Uh, warmer temperatures, longer growing season, more precipitation has made corn and soybean a more viable option up into the Dakotas. Uh, even into southern Canada, uh, our major corn growing regions. Corn for grain is shown from USDA up on the upper right hand side. And we still have, you know, our main corn growing areas in, in the I states, but, but we expand that area northward. And in fact, you know, that's what makes some economic issues related to, to corn a little bit different because it's, you know, it used to be if you had I state drought, well, that, that was a real problem for corn and soybean production. Well, with so much corn, corn and soybean production further north, you can have an I-state drought and those northern areas, if they're getting rainfall, can do quite well. So it's a really interesting uh, thing that we're talking about and something we're going to have to continue to talk about 
uh, over time is where we're growing crops and how those are changing over time. And then leaf wetness duration. Obviously, if you have higher humidity, you have longer periods of, of leaf wetness that increases your disease chances. Um, and we're gonna get to disease here in a little bit, uh, but those all kind of fit together. Uh, again, leaf wetness duration is a tougher one. We have leaf wetness sensors capability of doing that. There are some, some numerical criteria you can use to assess the potential for leaf wetness, um, but it's a really important when we're talking about disease issues on a wide variety of plants. Okay, next section. Try to get through these quickly as we can here. Biological indicators, plant related. Uh, weed ranges, insects, uh, pathogens, and pesticide use are, are three that we're dealing with here. Um, weed ranges, you know, pretty clear. Where weeds are susceptible, where they're able to spread, um, you know, and, and there are a number of these that have uh, climate related, and some of them are even um, CO2 related. Not, you know, CO2 is, is influencing the climate, but CO2 is also influencing it directly. Uh, there's, there's a, a, I don't have that graphic in here, a well-known graphic by one of the authors, Lou Ziska, showing uh, what increased CO2 did to Canada thistle. Uh, so there, and, and kudzu, which is shown in the graphic, the range of kudzu on the right-hand side, is apparently none of, another one of those weeds that likes additional carbon dioxide. So weeds are, in some cases, their range is increasing, and that is, is a real problem for us. Uh, the, the issue related to, to specifically shown down at the bottom in the way of kudzu is kudzu is, is a host for soybean rust. Uh, so far, we've been able to manage soybean rust when it appears in the southern U.S., but the spread of that could potentially cause more soybean rust issues. Insect infestation. Obviously, if you have warmer temperatures, you have things like uh, changes in, in, in ranges of, of insects where they're able to overwinter, how many life cycles you can have in a year, uh, any number of things that, that related to climate here specifically temperatures, sometimes precipitation, uh, that, that can be changed because of, of, of where, uh, because of climate change leading to changes in, in insect infestation. And then the third part of the, of the, of the IPM, school, IPM stool, uh, pathogens, changes in humidity, uh, changes in temperature also, changes in disease relationships, um, a number of different, the, uh, different issues related here. And then shifting pesticide use. This kind of morphs over into, into the socioeconomic pesticide use as a reaction to some of those changes in, 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 in the IPM series of things we talked about, but in leading to possible increases or changes in pesticide use as time goes along. Last, next to last set here, phenological indicators. Um, bud break and fruit trees, pollinators, chill units, uh, insect generation, uh, insect generation per season and disease vectors in livestock. Just kind of walking through these quickly again, uh, timing of bud break in fruit trees, a common thing that we are seeing in the Southeastern, Eastern US and even Midwest, um, perennial fruit trees, warmer temperatures reaching chilling requirements, uh, sooner than, 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 than before we have our potential last spring freeze, uh, really leading to uh, problems that's showing up more frequently with, with earlier bud break and fruit trees. And this has shown up to folks like the National Phenology Network, uh, earlier, earlier dates and, and many perennials, we're focusing on some of our, 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 uh, our uh, agricultural systems here. Uh, changes in pollinators, um, oddly enough, that was an interesting, uh, apparently an interesting thing or a potential problem this year up in our Michigan friends area, uh, cold temperatures um, during the time when, uh, when pollination should be occurring for some of our horticultural plants, it was too cold for the pollinators to be out. And we may see some issues related to this. So changing climate, changing impacts of pollinators, mismatching those, those relationships. Winter chill units, a commonly talked about, a common issue related to, uh, to, to some horticultural plants where the plants need to be at near a certain temperature 
typically that temperature is nearish freezing uh, and, and to accumulate changes in wintertime temperatures are changing that accumulation units. And we have some cases where uh, p uh, trees are reaching their chill units too early, leading to their earlier bud break. Or in some cases, uh, the temperatures weren't cold enough or way too cold, and they were not reaching their chill requirement. And if they don't reach their chill requirement, they, they typically don't produce. Insect generations per season related back to also uh, the, the in changes in insect infestation. And then disease vectors, uh, you know, movement of, of disease and where diseases can, can happen. Um, ticks being one of those things we're, talk we're talking about uh, related to that, and then the vectors related to that. And then our last one, um, uh, socioeconomic indicators are, 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 some of these are, 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 are definitely measurable. Others are a, a little bit still looking ahead related to this. And uh, I wish I had Linda on here to talk about some of these because she was more heavily involved in some of these. Uh, but they're but they're they're fairly straightforward for the most part. Crop insurance payments, because of changes in climate impacting what happens to to um, uh, to crops and leading to more crop insurance payment, more disease or excuse me, more disaster related issues uh, becoming more frequent, and that's happening in a wide range uh, around the country. Uh, different things in different places, though, sometimes. Wetness being more of an issue in the upper Midwest, drought being more of an issue more frequently in the Southwest, and, 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 and related issues to that. Uh, another one kind of interesting, uh, total factor productivity. Uh, I would love to have an economist to talk about this, but the, the short answer is assessing you know, there's been there's been some recent work talked about we've lost yield because of climate change. We lost potential yield because of climate change, which is is a legitimate result. But you know, there's there's also the, this mode of thought of we're able to maintain our yields, but are we having to use more inputs to maintain our yields because of degrading soils, changes in climate, and that sort of thing? So that idea of total factor productivity is basically trying to get at that. How, how, what are the inputs and what are we getting out of, of, of agricultural production because of those inputs we have put into them? And then a pretty directly related one at the end, you know, heat related mortality of agricultural workers um, and, and then mortality, but also heat stress issues. Um, you know, it, it, this is highest in the Southern US where you have more crops that require human, um, human uh, harvesting. Um, plus, you have a longer period of time through the year where, where heat and humidity are a problem, it, but it, it's not only those, it's, we still have those in, in the Midwest also, but the, the bigger issue areas have been the Southwest and some places in the Southeast uh, for, from a mortality standpoint. Okay, now I've walked you through all that, put you to sleep, let's wake you back up now. Okay, some parting thoughts. I, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of mentioned this along the way. I hope this is not a uh, an endpoint. I hope this is is something that we continue to work on over time, uh, because that is something we need to be able to continue to address as we go along. Um, this these this this document is something that you can use. You don't have to use that as a whole. You can. P, you know, piece out specific ones you want to talk about, share it with people, use it yourself, however you want to. Um, there are some next steps going on, trying to, okay, now that we've kind of laid out these, these things that we need to track, can we start developing and collecting that data and making it available at at least a regional, if not local level, so folks like you can say, Hey, I, I, I can see, I can pull this data off and show people. Here's the impact that we're having in this our, in this area. The, the the climatological ones we can we can are you know especially temperature and precipitation. Uh, we talked about with with Trent the other day. You can get that down to a, a, a hyper local, you know, a, a county level. Some of these others are going to take some time as we go along. It's going to take a bit more effort as we go along. Um, but but uh, I, I hope. And then again, there is active effort. And if there are things that you want to see specifically, we can try to do, we can try to speed that effort up. Uh, the start is in the Southeast right now. 
um, and and hopefully we can we can spread it more around the country. But if we need something more locally, we're sure willing to try to help that also more quickly. So, thank you for for sticking through this. I uh, would love your comments. Would love your folks to make use of this in in, in some form. Again, there's the full document. Two different places. Uh, uh, the National Ag Library or the direct the deck direct at the bottom. And again, specific thank you to, to Meg Walsh for putting these slides together. Uh, and then to all the other authors and, and stakeholders and reviewers who helped put this together. Okay, um, I will pause here and let the onslaught of You're an Idiot, Dennis, begin. Now, Dennis. <laughs> You do have a poll there. Uh, thank you for, for beginning to fill that out here. And we've got our first question in the chat. Um, number one, Trent says, great work. And uh, number two, along with farm worker physical health, was there any discussion of including uh, mental or emotional health as an indicator? I would have to, God, Linda, where did you go? I would, I would love to, to turn that over to Linda. Um, Again, that would tie. That would be a tough one, I would say, because again, one of the indicators are, are are replicable numbers. How can we show those numbers? And I agree that what you bring up is, is a valid concern. Can that be quantified in some way so that we can show that? And maybe there is. Um, so, but a, a very good thought. All right, we've got Melissa with a question in the chat. Any discussion with the U.S. Global Change Research Program to get these metrics included on their indicator platform? Um, we have presented to the U.S. GCRP because they were very interested uh, to, to, to learn about our process and what we did. Um, where they have gone with that, I don't know. That would be a, probably a meg question to see if, if anything more has happened. But um, they, they were very interested in, in what we came up with, but also the process we went through. Because I, I think that in addition to the doc, in addition to the indicators, it's, it's how you went about trying to create them, I think was good and, and something that we should share with people uh, more readily. And we're, we're trying to see if we can pull that together in a publication because it's, it's, worth, it's worth at least noting how we went through that. Okay. One last call. If you've got any questions, the Q and A or the chat. Um, Tracy put a comment in about newer corn areas on irrigation. Um, but Tracy, the areas in the Dakotas are not highly irrigated. There are minor irrigation areas but those areas are primarily dry land areas and, and really not much irrigation. So yeah, parts of the places in Nebraska, Kansas obviously are, but those Northern Plains area irrigation is, is not nearly as, as much as used as much as further South. Okay, I do wanna call everyone's attention to the chat where Brett has posted some indigenous health indicators that do get at social and emotional health. Julie, you're unmuted. I have a question, Dennis. I hope I have an and, answer. <laughs> so like with, with these indicators and just kind of, you know, where agriculture is at right now, where do you see some of the most hope for agriculture to adapt to climate change? And then the second part is where do you see the most hope for uh, mitigation from agriculture? Um, okay. One, I, I, I think it is always good to help people adapt to changing conditions to help them see the reality close to them. Because I'm sure you recognize along with other people that farmers are hyper local. Well, we get, they get the rain over there, but we don't get that rain over here. Okay. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. But it's, 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 it's that way. So being able to localize how things are changing, hopefully can help encourage them and quantify how they need to adapt. Um, we need to give them more options on adaptation. 
I think if there are some more options, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but here are some things you can do. Some are conservation practices. Some may be changing crops, changing cropping systems are ways that people can adapt to take advantage, uh, maybe not take advantage of the changes, but deal with some of the changes more readily. Um, there, there, and I can't, as a USDA person, I can't talk about policy. Changes in what has happened in the administration have really caused a huge change in discussions at the ground level in the way of what, what, you know, what, and we've talked about this a little bit recently about carbon payments, you know, practices and that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot to be unpacked there and a lot to be done, but I'm hoping we have some staying power in that and we can keep moving that down along the way so that we weren't talking about, you know, practices and soils just because it's good for your soils. Well, now it can be good for your economics too. Um, I'm hoping that we're able to do that and begin to move that process because we all know ag doesn't change quickly. It, it just doesn't. So we, we, we've, we've got to keep putting this, keep talking about it, continue to give people options along the way. Okay, we've had a couple more questions pop up in the chat here. Um, as, as Linda's research supports, there is a, uh, a huge influencer on farmers in their family, right? Um, and is there any indicator impact on uh, family and support health or buy-in in that regard? Um, again, I, I wasn't as involved with the, the socioeconomic indicators. Uh, there was probably was, um, yeah, family, um, U2U and the corn cap survey, family certified crop advisors, Definitely, that's something that, that, that I keep thinking about. How do we get more of these advisors on thinking about this and talking about this? Um, you know, instead of just fixing this problem, how do we look larger about how we, how we work on larger problems? So, um, we, you know, if you have thoughts on, it, on, on indicators, let me know. Because I, I, I want to, I've got a few in my head, but I'd like to have some other ones that are, that are hanging out there that we could go back to folks at USDA and say, you know, we've got a list of 10 or 12 more thoughts on, on what we can do. Uh, another one that we didn't put in was drought. Drought impacts, uh, changing drought impacts on agriculture. So I think we need to do something related to that too. Excellent. Okay. Tom likes his questions loaded. So I'm going to, I'm going to quote. <laughs> Tom here. And, and for the recording, this is a quote. I do know uh, Tom. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, climate change is increasing the number of intense rainfall events. Intense rainfalls cause a disproportionate amount of erosion and nutrient runoff. U.S. Ag is responsible for only around 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. The remainder of society has a tremendous negative impact on water quality. Do you think the larger society understands their tremendous negative impact they have on water quality soil health through climate change? He asks about the larger society or, okay, okay, yeah. Um, God, I, 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 I got to sidestep that question, Tom. I got to sidestep that question. It's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a loaded question and I could get into a lot of trouble for, 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 for posing on what, what, what could be behind this. We know agriculture is a big player and we know that agriculture is impacted heavily by changes in precipitation, uh, particularly in the way of soil loss and nutrient loss. Um, there are other players in this and we need to, this needs to be an all hands on deck. I mean, uh, you know, urban people will point at agriculture, agriculture point at urban people. And I sit in the middle and kind of chuckle about the whole situation and go, we need to stop this. We need to stop this. We need to figure out ways that, that we can work together on solutions. Um, I'm being idealistic. I, I have to try to be. And I will say to Tom's question that there is definitely a push uh, in certain regions, watersheds for urban soil health initiatives that will educate uh, residents of cities and towns 
villages on uh, their relationship to soil health. All right, I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment, and we are coming up on a break. So thank you, Dennis. Appreciate your time. And uh, we will reconvene at 1040. So 14 minute break here.